You know, I don't think we've ever chatted with a multimedia artist before. I could be wrong. Yes, and especially one who is very talented collage artist. You know what? And also to make this more interesting, he's a psychiatrist. Mm-hmm. It'll be interesting to see how this all fits together, don't you think? Yes, he's an interesting guest that has so much to share about living creatively. You bet. everyone. Hope you've been having a wonderfully creative week. I'm Rod Jones, and we celebrate what people love to do creatively by giving them a voice so you can learn from their experiences in life. And I'm NG Jones. Welcome to Thought Road Podcast. We invite you to subscribe wherever you listen, and we focus on sharing with everyone how they can think, be, and live more creatively with their own passions. For sure. Um, Okay, Angie, how about telling our listeners who our most insightful guest is today? Okay, well, today our very creative guest is Stephen Rudin. He's a multimedia artist, speaker, teacher, and a psychiatrist. And you know what? I understand that he's going to share with us the psychology of collage. That's going to be pretty interesting. That that sounds so good. I I can't wait to talk to him. (laughs) But I suspect you're going to have a very interesting quote to start this episode off today. Am I right? Yes, you are, Ron. Okay, so here is a a meaningful quote for today, and it comes from Renee Maria Rilke. And here is his quote. It is good to be solitary, for solitude is difficult. That something is difficult must be a reason for us to do it more. Great quote. Yeah. You know, to me, the interesting thing about virtually all forms of creativity is that it requires a certain amount of solitude. And jokingly, of course, today's most people are not willing to go live by a pond like Thoreau. In fact, that's probably pretty difficult to find a pond to be creative and meditative by because my guess it's surrounded by condos. (laughs) That's true. So true. Well, you know, I, I think that the quote by Rilke reminds me of an, the author, J.D. Salinger. Oh, good analogy. Yeah, you'll remember him as the author of Catcher in the Rye. His, uh, his life was so fascinating. He really did isolate himself in the woods of New Hampshire, for those that don't know too much about his personal life. And he became somewhat of a recluse because he wanted to concentrate on his writing. And he did continue to write after his... Um, very famous book. And one can imagine that it was such a fertile period for his personal creativity. Well, you know, I think all of our guests, as well as our listeners, Mm -hmm. all have experienced really wonderfully creative uh, ideas pop into their mind. And quite often it happens to us when we're by ourselves. Yeah, yeah, true. But I believe our guest is going to share with us what is behind his motivation to create. Mm -hmm. I'm really interested in that, especially philosophically. I think we can learn a lot from him. Yeah, I think we can too. So, okay, let's go on to our interview with Stephen Rudin. Great. Stephen, welcome to the Thought Row podcast. It's always a pleasure to have a multimedia artist. And I might add that you are also a psychiatrist and a teacher. Hi, yes, Stephen. So good to have you with us today. You know, I know our listeners are really going to greatly benefit from hearing your creative journey. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. I'm so inspired by what you are both doing. And we share this sort of motivation to um, support and promote creativity in all its shapes and forms. So I'm particularly interested in, in talking to you about that. And then also to talk with you about psychology and collage. Excellent. Excellent. Just what we wanted to hear about. But, you know, before we get started, we always ask our guests what they had for breakfast. So, Stephen, what did you have? So a window into my life. So I had a uh, cereal with uh, berries and bananas and walnuts and soy milk. I'm on a plant-based diet, so you really get a window. Ah, okay. Oh, that's nice, though. Very it's very healthy. good for you. Very good for you. Yeah, definitely. And also good for brain power. 
Yes. Good for brain power, good for the environment. You know, there are a lot of, there are a lot of reasons why I, I try to limit my, uh, I won't say that occasionally I have, you know, sushi, even though I'm on a plant based diet, that's one thing I can't give up. And I'm no stranger to a baked good. So, <laughs> but for the most part, <laughs> for the most part, I try to stick with plant based. Well, you know, it's, it's always nice for us to know where people are originally from and where they grew up. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your story? So, um, so we're going to get right into the idea of collage and basically that my works, um, uh, explores collage as a metaphor for memory and identity. So right off the bat, in terms of talking about my story, I sort of started off as a collage. My mother is from Chicago and her family hails from Turkey and Greece from a really large family. And my father is from New York and his family hails from Latvia and Lithuania. So I already started off with that Northern Southern European sort of mix. And I was born in Chicago and um, uh, where my father was in medical school. And then we moved to New Jersey to a suburb outside of New York City when I was uh, two months old. Mm. And then we lived there until I was eight years old. So there's a layer. There's all these layers. And then we moved back to Chicago when my parents got divorced. But my father stayed in New York. So I've always had that connection to New York. And then I came to New York uh, for college. I went to Cornell University, went to medical school here. And I've been in New York City for almost 30 years. Oh, almost your whole life. Yes. You really are a collage. You, all the different events in your life really, um, you know. Created a collage. Yeah. Do, do you have a, a favorite childhood memory that you'd like to share with us? Sure. You know, I, I particularly liked this idea of, of childhood memory. So, you know, obviously as a psychiatrist, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about memories and childhood memories. And so um, my favorite memories in childhood have to do with creating. And so, like, when I think about it, I think of myself sort of laying on the floor. Um, my family is around, and I'm either drawing or coloring, and then later on moving to the dining room table, moving to my desk, listening to music. And my family always rallied around me in terms of basically my brothers and my mother and my stepfather. They were always very supportive of me and my art. So I have this very, you know, very sort of fond memories of, of art in my life. And I think of art as basically a place and a friend. In other words, art has always been there for me. It's always been a place that I could tap into and was always welcoming to me. So my childhood memories have to do with creating art. And I realized in a lot of ways that that was a wonderful thing. And that's what I want to share with the world, too, is I want to share this idea that art is a place that you can always tap into, that you don't even have to leave where you are and you can always go into that place of art. Well, it's a, certainly a place where you can find your own solacement. I mean, you can be have solace in your creativity or it's a solo activity 90% of the time. Mm -hmm. So true. I, I joke and I say that basically that, you know, that art also helps you to become a better friend to yourself. You yes. know, that sometimes I joke. No, <laughs> and I but say how that, accurate. You know, that's no, very that's accurate. That's really true. Yeah. That you're the only person that you can't get away from. So art really helps you to basically, you know, a lot of times in our lifetime, we're, we're trying to distract ourselves. We're trying to get away from ourselves. But art is one of these places where we sort of like center in in ourselves. And we really go deep into ourselves. And I think we develop a be you know, better relationship with ourselves because it has to do with basically, you know, we become good company to ourselves. And I think that's a really essential skill in life is to be able to be good company to yourself. Yeah, if you don't like yourself, who else is going to like you, right? Right, and then also uh, nowadays, I think we have so many distractions that keep you from engaging with yourself. So, you know, I really like what you said, Stephen, on that. Yeah, so in other words, I was thinking about that too, you know, like when... Uh, you know, every time I, I talk with other artists or other creative people, it sort of spurs me to think about other things. But I also think that, you know, you know, there's basically there's pluses and minuses to the way that the world is connected. Mm -hmm. But in one in one sense, you really don't ever have to be alone. You always can feel that you're connected. But on the other hand, it's not exactly the same as being connected. So I think more now more than ever, we need to develop a good relationship with ourselves because it can get confusing. We might feel that we need to always be connected to other people, but but really, basically, the time we spend with ourselves is, is really just as important. Sure. Turn off the news, go for a walk, and leave your phone behind. Exactly. Exactly. Very true. You know, on my next question um, for you is creativity is one thing we believe everyone can express Let's start with your you approaching it from your perspective as a psychiatrist. 
Love that question. So I agree with you that creativity is something that everybody can express. And I think about the idea that we all have the tools inside of us. We just have to learn how to use them. We have to be encouraged to use them. So what you, the work that you, you know, that Angie and Rob that you're doing Mm -hmm. is so important in terms of promoting, you know, that it's basically that all of us have this creative uh, creativity inside of us. And that's where my classes, and we'll talk about that in a little bit as an art teacher, Mm -hmm. is that my classes are about inspiring people that want to be creative but don't necessarily know how to be creative. So I try to basically sort of set a path forward for them to basically encourage them to be creative. Um, But I think of basically of creativity is just basically something new and something adaptive. And the idea of creativity is that basically is that um, regular problem solving as opposed to creative problem solving is that regular problem solving is just that there's a set way to do it. And creative problem solving, it basically it essentially requires for you to think outside of the box mm-hmm. and for you to sort of rely on your own internal, like what you have inside your mind already, and then combine it, almost collage it, if you will, with other with other information that you might not feel is related. You know what I mean? By combining, you know, like a vacuum and a washing machine together. In other words, to basically the creativity is about creating something new out of something maybe that already exists. Sure. Yeah. You know, um, an interesting thought I had is your education as a psychiatrist, uh, what has that taught you about your own creative process and your mission? I mean, it's hard to imagine, well, you would know better than us how those two would fit together, but I suspect there is a strong correlation between being a psychiatrist and also your own creative process. So I think of basically as my artistic production as almost as a projection of my unconscious, almost like a dream. So, of course, you know, in dream analysis, you know, people say, like, why did I dream that? And then we make an interpretation. So my art is the same way. I might think that it means something, but I might realize later on at some point in the future that it means something else. That for me, art is a chronicle. It's a special language, if you will, a communication platform that basically is it's almost like another language in the sense that I'm translating something from the unconscious into something that is concrete and observable and you can see and then you can interpret it. But at the end of the day, just like in a psychotherapy, you may be right or I may be wrong. Hmm. So my my basic so my training as a psychiatrist has taught me to approach it with this like inquisitiveness, but also with a little bit of skepticism to say that basically maybe what I think the interpretation of the work is and maybe what the interpretation of the work can change. I think that that's a really important concept in life. In other words, sometimes we interpret, you know, our our behavior or the behavior of other people in a certain way. We need to leave it open. In other words, something might happen later on in our lives and we might say, you know what? Maybe he or she said that because of this. Maybe I did that because of this. So I think my psychiatry training has taught me to basically be curious, almost in the way like in a dream analysis or an analysis of my behavior. Like, why did I do this? Why did I produce this? So there, there's a lot of that in there. You know, that's yeah. really interesting because um, I think, I don't know, maybe I, I do this more often than other people. I don't know. But we tend to categorize things very uh Uh, Like, okay, this goes in this folder in my head and this goes in that folder. And what you're saying is to be more fluid and letting it not be categorized so much so it can be used in multi areas. So you can move around in those folders, right? Exactly. That's exactly. This is why this kind of a conversation is so wonderful to have. And why I like to have conversations with people about creativity is Mm -hmm. because they sort of fill in the blanks for me. That we don't, that with collage in particular, and we'll talk about that later on, is that we're basically, we're changing the folders, right? We're putting, I'm particularly putting things in a folder that didn't start off in the same folder. Mm -hmm. And maybe they were in multiple folders. But this idea, like you just said, of categorizing things and about having those categories be too rigid Mm -hmm. is what we call, you know, rigidity. And to be more flexible, that's a goal of almost every psychotherapy is to be more flexible, is to basically not put rigid categorization on behavior you know for Mm -hmm. example like that was unacceptable across the board well maybe it was acceptable because so-and-so was going through a grieving or a mourning and maybe i need to like you know decategorize if you will right right or sympathetic yeah that makes a lot of sense yeah um you know there are many ways one can express themselves creatively as we were talking about and you seem to embrace collage art tell us why you chose that medium Stephen. I think collage chose me. (laughs) (laughs) 
So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll tell you the history of my collage and then we can interpret it just like we interpret the dream. And, yes. you know, one of my one of my ideas about, you know, memory in general is that each time we remember something, we remember it slightly differently and that we need to have a tolerance for that. So the story changes. So every time I tell the story, you know, it changes slightly. But the story of the collage is that essentially um, I've been collecting magazines forever. You know, and basically magazines served an important role for me, particularly before the Internet. If you wanted to see something pop culture, you'd have to get a magazine or you could see it on television. But if you really wanted to see it over and over and over again, mm -hmm. you really had to do it. Right. You had to get a magazine and magazines also at that time, you know, it's not like it like it was a coveted item for me. In other words, like there wasn't a lot of money in the budget for magazines. So anytime I got a magazine, I cherished it. And people would drop off magazines because they knew that I liked them. And I would draw from them, use them as reference materials. And then about 10 years ago, you know, I was, I was basically, you know, accumulating these magazines from my waiting room in my office. And um, I decided that I wanted to make a collage that had to do with home and making a setting. Because remember, I talked about this idea of art as a place. I'm very place oriented. I, in my mind, I close my eyes. I think about all the places I've been. So I basically, so I started to collage them together, you know, collage making these scenes that looked like realistic scenes. And they were sort of like collaging all my favorite places together. Mm -hmm. And then um, I just started doing it over and over and over again. I was, just, you know, I just couldn't stop every minute. I was just thinking about how I would plan one out and I was snipping and clipping and, it, you know, like we would go away on vacation and I would do magazines and just clip the entire vacation. And, and then I thought to myself, well, why am I doing this? In other words, like, you know, any good, you know, psychotherapist would, you know, try to analyze their own motivations as well. Right. And I say, why am I doing this? Right. 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 Uh, and so I said to myself, basically, well, I realized that I was basically telling stories and I was showing that multiple stories could be told using the same parts. So back to that categorization idea that basically that you could that you that I could basically move one piece of the collage and make it go from a dystopian scene to a utopian scene just with a tiny, tiny modification. And then I thought. Well, that's what I'm doing in psychotherapy with people is I'm helping them to re-collage their stories. They come in with like a box of collage snippets and they say, this goes here and this goes here and this goes here and this goes here. And therefore, that's the way I feel that. That's why I feel that way about myself. And then I would say, but what if this goes here and that goes there? And that, in other words, you could tell multiple stories with those parts. You could tell a story of a person who perseveres or a person who basically at the end of the day triumphed over adversity, basically just by changing the parts around. So over time, I've come to understand that really what the collage is, it's just basically this vehicle or this vessel. Fascinating. That <laughs> This is fascinating. I'm going to ask you a kind of the same question a little bit, but maybe from a different angle. As a collage artist, you literally create stories with found images. And obviously you had lots of magazines to yes. work from. <laughs> and uh, more often than not, I'm assuming you cut them out with scissors. Uh, what is the actual process of building a collage? But more importantly, tell us how you see yourself creating stories with your artwork. And you just kind of shared a yeah, little bit of that. you were touching on that. So I have a particular method. So I'm basically, you know, as a cognitive behavioral therapist, we always are seeking to boil things down and to say like exactly like, in other words, what is psychological change? What makes things stick? I think that's such an important analogy, this analogy of glue. In other mm. words, what makes things stick, right? In other words, you try to basically go into an exercise routine. Why does one exercise routine stick? And another one doesn't stick. Mm -hmm. So with a collage, it's not a collage until it's glued until it's glued down, until it's stuck down. And a lot of times the materials don't cooperate. But um, I have a method, which I call ODRA R, observation, deconstruction, rehearsal, assembly, refinement. So I start off by literally memorizing thousands and thousands of images in my mind. Then I start to cut them out. And then I start to think, well, I saw a staircase somewhere. I saw this two years ago. Where did I put the, it requires a lot of memory if you can remember. Oh, yes, it does. <laughs> It does. <laughs> That's why I think that my work has to do with memory is because all I, you know, it requires me to remember all of this, all of these and remember where I put them and remember where they are. And then, you know, so be, and similarly with the mind, right? In other words, we have all these memories, these layers and we scratch the surface. So I observe all the materials first, I cut them out. Then I basically rehearse them. I play I create these scenes, like these almost like dramatic scenes, almost like a child would play with action figures or with dolls. In mm -hmm. other words, that the, that the characters in my scenes, they have relationships with each other. They have relationships with me. They basically, and the stories come in and out and, and out. So it's almost like, you know, it's a, it's very playful. And then basically I lay them out 
it takes me a while to lay them out. Maybe it takes me a few weeks to get the composition set. I look at my phone a lot. I take a lot of pictures of my camera. I dream about them. I daydream about them. I think about like how to make them more, you know, tighter, how to make, I always want to basically catapult the viewer in. So I think like, is it deep enough? Are there enough, you know, little nooks and crannies for discovery? And then I leave them basically sort of unlaid down for months at a time. And then finally, when I have the mental fortitude to glue them down, because I have, they have to, it takes 50 plus hours to glue one down with intense concentration. And of course, you can imagine that the magazines can get damaged at any point. And if I put something in the wrong order, but then again, I also allow myself the freedom at the end. That's why I say this refinement after the assembly that I allow myself to change the story at the very end, because at the end of the day, I believe that you can have this very, um, you know, you know, very tight story about yourself, but allow some flexibility at the end for you to maybe like, you know, these last finishing touches may, may make the difference, like I said, between like a dystopian and a utopian story. That's amazing. That's really fascinating. It, it, it is fascinating. It. Just a, a quick answer on this question. I'm just do a little quick follow up here. I think a lot of people would like to know, what is your workspace like? Do you have a, a big table that you're constantly working on or you move these around your home or do you put one on your coffee table and look at it and then go to the kitchen and look at another one? How, how is all this stuff laid what's out? What's your process? What's your, your process? tactile process? Yeah. So the, the, I could basically like get a degree in library science from, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I actually have a, I have a lot of tables, but under I have this table. So if you can imagine like a, a baker's, like an oven that has like cookie sheets in it, you know? Mm-hmm. So I basically, so I have them, I lay them down on like a illustration board and then I sort of pulled them and I put them in this table that has these shelves underneath and I pull them out so I can see them because there's, there's maybe six, eight inches in between the shelves. So I can see them as they're baking, you know, and then mm-hmm. I can pull them out when I want to glue them down. So I basically work on a flat surface, but I have these tables that I had built that have these shells underneath, like basically like almost like a baker. And they do hatch in litters. In other words, like, for example, now I'm at a point where I'm gluing a lot of them down. So I have like all these, so I just pull one out, I glue it down, I pull the other one out. It takes weeks, you know, to do that, but they tend to basically hatch in litters, you know, where basically like five or six of them hatch at the same time. Is there continuity between those then? There is continuity between them. I also, since I'm working on, uh, uh, they're almost like a retrospective, like six months ago. And sometimes it's really interesting because sometimes, you know, I'm not going to go so far as to say that I can see the future, but sometimes basically I look at the collage and it's so relevant to what's happening right now. But then again, you know, there's a power, you know, in the, you know, what we're aware of. Sure. We, it was different. Like sometimes things reveal themselves in dreams to us. I, I do believe that happens. Yeah. Angie, what is your brilliant question? Well, you know, I, I wanted to go back to the psychiatry for a moment. Um, I wanted to know which came first, the art or your medical profession? And can those two work comfortably with each other? Or do you have to disengage from your psychiatry career to bring the art to the surface? Another wonderful question. So we're really getting down to the root of it. (laughs) That was a good question. (laughs) Yeah, it's got multiple parts. So, uh, you know, and I'll give you an answer. They say, I'll give you one answer with 16 subunits. (laughs) So so we talked about the idea that I think of collage is a metaphor for identity. So I've always been an artist. That's been an important part of my identity. And so basically ever since, you know, I'm a really small child. And so basically, um, but I was good in math and science too. And I wanted to help people. And I was actually a language major in college. I was uh, modern languages, linguistics with a particular emphasis on Spanish literature. And uh, basically, so I have these multiple parts of myself. But um, so then basically, so I, I say that I used to think of myself as a psychiatrist and an artist. And now I just think of myself as an artist and a psychiatrist. So whereas before the art would basically fuel the psychiatry practice, now the psychiatry fuels the art practice. So in some ways, I think like, you know, a writer writes what they know about. And so mm-hmm. an artist obviously, you know, creates work about what they know about. I mean, I know a lot about psychiatry at this point. I spent, you know, about 20, you know, 20 plus years yeah, as a psychiatrist. Time. So that's a big part of my identity. So my art is like what I feel like I'm doing now is I'm actually 
it's not that I'm disengaging from, but I'm basically look, looking at it from a new angle. I'm translating my work as a psychiatrist and all that I learned through the mind through this wonderful new language of art. And I think to myself, oh, that's what that's about. Oh, that's what, in other words, that's the way we learn. That's the way we acquire knowledge. That's the way we create meaning in our lives. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the way we deal with frustration. That's the way we deal with lack of motivation. So I'm, I'm just looking at it from a new angle now. So if anything, I'm even more involved in psychiatry because in some ways also now as an artist, I feel like I'm like on this research sabbatical and I can read about any topic I want to for hours and hours on end. Whereas before, obviously, time, you mm -hmm. know, I couldn't just read about, you know, psychiatry and data, for example, but now I can. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, very interesting. You know, we learned from our initial interview that you teach. Uh, tell us what you hope to give to your students and what you hope to gain when you teach them. Well, thank you for asking me about that, because teaching is a really important part of my identity, too. You know, when we think about basically like uh, as an artist, when I write my bio, I basically say that I'm a visual artist, teacher, and psychiatrist, and because teacher is a big part of what I and people ask, you know, I had one, did an interview once upon a time and they said, you know, basically, it was just like a bum, 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 like sort of like bullet points. And it was basically it was basically therapy or education. And I thought, well, therapy is education and education is therapy. So I feel like they're both they're sort of very interrelated. But the students give me a tremendous amount because they challenge me in ways in which I basically change the categories of things. You know what I mean? I always as a, I was a teacher at a, a, a teacher of mostly cognitive behavioral therapy at Columbia for a really long time. And, and the students, mostly uh, psychiatrists in training, they would always bring up new angles. So there's no question that the teaching basically makes me a better artist and basically, and, uh, and that basically the teaching also makes me a better teacher for future, you know, students. And what I really want to basically do with students is I want to inspire them and I want to motivate them because I think about these two essential ingredients. In other words, like, why do we start a project? Well, first of the thing that we start a project, we start because we're inspired. But how do we maintain our motivation in the face of, you know, obstacles and adversity? So basically, so I want to help them to basically continue to, you know, persevere because I believe that in art, art is not a linear process. It's not like you sit down and all of a sudden you're good. Everybody wants to sit down and be like, great at it but you know the best tennis players in the world you know they showed some promise but they put in the time they had to basically persevere they had to go through a lot of bad practices and a lot of bad practice games in order to get to the other side so i want to help the students to maintain their motivation even in the and to basically and to be open to the idea that it's the unexpected surprises in the art that are so powerful when you think all this loss like i was making a collage yesterday and i glued it all down and i said oh i hate this and then basically i said oh well what if i cover this with this and now i've opened up a whole new genre of collage basically by without getting into it but it's like looking through a window through a window through a window but it was because i covered up the mistake that i made with a new layer yeah you so layered that's it that's what i <laughs> I love it. I guess so there's started. there's really no mistakes that you can make in being creative or or in art, even though sometimes you look at it and go, oh, no, this stinks. What did I do? But then as you develop it, I, I loved how you went through the process and really, um, I guess, exercised your creative muscles even more. So that was really a cool thing. I think for me, one of the things I've always noticed is I'll go back and look at a painting that I did several years ago. Yeah. And I'll ask myself. Where in the heck did that come from? <laughs> and then sometimes I don't even believe I did it. Does that ever happen to you, yeah. uh, Stephen? Does that ever happen yeah, to you where you look back and go, man, I can't even imagine this? it. What, the, what was I thinking that day? I think to myself, how did I have the concentration? <laughs> <laughs> I think to myself, yeah, I do definitely. I do definitely have. But I was so, there was something else that you brought up also that Inji brought up that I think is really important too is that I don't think it's necessarily that any one individual piece that basically that defines whether or not it's good or bad. In other words, I like to think of it like the idea that I haven't yet created my best work mm -hmm. and that everything that I'm doing now is preparation for something in the future. Because I'm sure that both of you have had the experience also where you create something, you struggle with it, you struggle with it, you struggle with it, you hate it, and then you create something in 10 minutes that you love. So then it was like, well, did that piece take 10 minutes or did it take 30 years yeah, plus 10 exactly. minutes? Yeah, exactly. Yes, very good That's point. That's a very good very point. Good point. And I agree with that because, like you said, sometimes you'll work endlessly on a piece and then 
you're like, okay, I can't with this anymore. You put it away and then you, you make something in a few minutes and you're like, wow, where does this come from? And but then it's you the ask, struggle. You ask your significant other, is this any good? Yes, <laughs> and always. Then, and then they're always on the, uh, uh, well, it looks very good to me. Yeah, or, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm big on basically on be- choosing the person that you ask. You know, that's part of my thing about maintaining your motivation. I'm like, don't ask somebody who only likes figurative art about an abstract piece. You know what I mean? Don't ask somebody who only likes abstract art. I, I have a friend who basically says, I ask her, I say, how is this? She says, is it glued down yet? <laughs> <laughs> if it's glued down and she says, you should move this. It's like, oh, no, but I know I can go to her. So. You know, I, I feel like ident- identifying people, you know, like if somebody basically, you know, it enters this negative energy into your sphere and basically and they're coming from a perspective where they don't quite know where, where, you know, you might start off by saying, I know you don't like abstract work, but what, you know what I mean? So basically you got to be, I, I feel that, you know, you've got to be selective with who you ask. I was well, going to say, also, I really like that. Yeah, and if you ask, exactly. And if you Edit. ask somebody for an opinion, guess what? You're going to get it. Yeah. And no matter what. <laughs> you, what's your opinion on this? it's not good to ask. No, I it's know. definitely not good to ask. And you have to be yeah. kind of selective in who you ask, just like Stephen said. Exactly. If somebody hates abstract and you're showing them don't abstract art, they're yeah, going to go, this stuff them. makes me, makes my stomach upset. Or I don't understand. Yeah. yeah, I don't understand. Or they're going to say, like, what is this? I don't get it. So sometimes I say to basically somebody goes down this negative, you know, path. And I, yeah. I say like this, I say, I cannot take any negativity. I feel like that's also about the idea of like getting your needs met. In other words, like, I don't need to hear from you this. Basically, all I'm asking about is what about this upper left hand corner? In other words, basically, so being able to ask for the feedback, that's a big part of my lesson plan. And and we talk about as a group is about asking for feedback in the way in which you're going to get the feedback that you need. Because some people just put themselves like a filet out there and they say, like, what do you think? When really what they're asking is they're saying they really want to ask you, like, do you think this is appropriate for a show that, you know, has to do with play? And then really, but they're not asking whether or not you think it's any good. Right, because you want the approval, but you don't know how to ask. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Very true. You know, I wanted to ask you about the word cognitive, because I know it gets bantered about in your profession, but I suspect it has a substantial meaning, meaning when it comes to creativity. Um, share your thoughts on that. Another wonderful question. It's a question I've never been asked before, which I really, really appreciate. Then we so, expect we expect a very succinct cognitive <laughs> answer. answer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I've never been known to be succinct, but I, I guess the <laughs> I guess the point across, but never in you know a hundred words or less, it's hard for me. But uh, <laughs> but I'll tell you. But cognitive means basically at its very core, it just has to do with thinking. Mm-hmm. So basically, there are different functions of the brain. So one of the functions of the brain would be like motor, right? And I feel like, for example, like a lot of art skills have to do with what we call like procedural memory. Like you don't even think about it, but you end up learning how to hold the pencil or hold the brush in a particular way to make a particular effect. And that has to do a lot with like muscle memory. That's like, you know, to use the tennis analogy, it's like you don't think about it. You think about how to make the serve in the beginning, but eventually over time, you basically, your body knows what to do. Mm-hmm. So cognitive has to do with thinking. So some of the ideas of thinking have to do with like attention. And then of course, memory, which is a big part of what, what I, what I investigate and then pattern recognition and categorization and basically, uh, so cognitive has to do with basically the, the way that we think. And as a cognitive behavioral therapist, we think that the way that we think is really important because if you think in a particular, we say the way you think affects the way you feel and the way you feel affects the way you think. So if you're feeling really rotten, your thought process is going to be like, oh, well, this is lousy and that's lousy. And similarly, if you're too hard on yourself and you basically are too critical of yourself, you're going to feel bad. So the relationship between thinking and feeling is a major area of focus for me throughout you know, my entire career. Mm-hmm. And I think that what what uh, other I, I often think that certain other kinds of art forms, such as like uh, expressive painting, for example, they have to do with like maybe more emotional and less thinking, but cognitive. But uh, I feel that collage is more cognitive because it's like about, you know, the or at least for me, it is because I'm putting together this story in a way of basically like, you know, it's, it's almost like like I'm writing a story like a literature. In other words, it has to do with the way that you put information together and the meaning that's derived from the way that you put the information. Very together. good. Very good. 
Yeah, thank you for that. I want to ask you this question, and maybe you can condense the answer slightly. Uh, you as a creative person and a teacher must have a reoccurring theme or thought in your mind about creativity. How would you express that so our listeners can learn from your experiences? So I'm a big believer in the idea that it's not important what you create, but just important that you create. In other words, I feel that basically when, when I was in medical school, somebody said to me, you know, it's not really that important what you read. It's just important that you read. So when you're learning about cardiology, you learn about psychiatry. When you're basically learning about the history of, you know, like uh, surrealism, you learn about psychiatry. So I believe that creating in and of itself, that the intention of creating in and of itself, that it's not so important what you create, but it's important that you create. So just an intention to create wherever possible would be something that I would encourage people to do. So people sometimes say, you know, I, I'm taking care of so-and-so. I'm taking care. I have no time to create. Well, you maybe have time to like deviate with a recipe that you're making for dinner by adding a new ingredient to it or basically or rearranging something in your life. In other words, that, that takes into this idea of new and adaptive. So my idea about creativity is really about the idea that that just create. In other words, don't be too preoccupied with what, what you create. Over time, what you create is going to become more sophisticated or, you know, just like any other kind of training. Yeah, when people don't have time to create, I always suggest they just change the silverware drawer, move the knives over one notch and move the spoons over another notch. It'll make you think creatively all day long when you're trying to pick up a spoon. We would be great roommates, you and I. <laughs> <laughs> True. Um, you know, Stephen, what would be the one thing that you would tell people that want to live a more creative life? So I would basically tell them that, you know, that to widen their definition of what they consider to be creative, because certain people will say, oh, I'm not creative. But then you basically look into their lives and you say, of course, you're creative. The way that you dealt with your son or your daughter, your grandkid, your friend, you know, your student, that showed a lot of creativity. So to expand the idea of creativity, in other words, creativity doesn't just mean picking up a pencil or picking up a paintbrush or, or creating something that's a visual art or, or, or but that basically that creates that the definition definition of creativity can just be expanded to anything. Basically, I would just say creativity is just mixing it up, changing it up, experimenting with basically, I would just say like, essentially, like if you want to use collage as the example, mm -hmm. just collage things in your life. That's like a great that. answer. In fact, that's one of the best answers we've ever received on that. Yeah, it's, I, it's, I think so. And I, I love the way that you said that because, you know, we all have different tones of creativity in our life and sometimes you know people categorize it too much like we were talking earlier i'm not a good painter i am not a good musician it's like well but everybody's different you have to celebrate your own creativity and For i really sure. liked your answer that was a good answer so good you know every successful creative person tries to be original and authentic but there are times when we all have some self-doubt i know i have how do you manage to get through those times assuming you have any yes of course I, like everybody else <laughs> that's uh, you know that's how i learned it's basically i look at my own stuff right so i one of the the other sort of topics that we because i have a course that it, i started off with a course that was called psychology of collage and then it became collage's memoir and then the third iteration of the course is called collage and the creative process. And so we talk about the process. In other words, that creativity is a process. It's not like you sit down, you want to be creative, and then that's where it ends. It zigzags. It's circular. It basically, but one of the things we also talk about is this role of the inner critic, which rears its head. In other words, the inner critic rears its head. And some people would say, oh, the inner critic has no role. In other words, my inner critic tells me like, you're never going to be able to create something as good as what you've already created. It's luck. It was a fluke. You know what I mean? Basically, especially when things are not going great, mm -hmm. you know? And so I say to myself, like people would say, get rid of the inner critic. And I would say, but the inner critic is my best friend. The inner critic has gotten me out of so many jams, saved my bacon on so many occasions. So I would say that basically what I do is I want to keep my inner critic in check. And I want to basically make sure my inner critic doesn't become a bully that just tells me this is lousy, give it up. But my inner critic might say, you know what? That's not amazing. I wouldn't show that to the 
curator at the Met. Mm-hmm. So, so it's about keeping my inner critic in check. Well, sometimes your inner critic can save your bacon. I mean, I think yeah, that we Stephen wouldn't, was saying, we wouldn't yes. have survived. Uh, yes. The man would have never survived had he not been listening to his inner critic at times, right? Well, yeah. Yeah, don't, don't go into that cave because you don't know what's in there. Exactly. That's why I say basically it's not about getting rid of your inner critic. It's about basically saying, you know, like, in other words, if we think of this idea, because I'm very interested in like early civilizations, that there were people that served in that society. And if we think about because there's a kind of, you know, psychotherapy where we break the mind into these different parts. And that's where this idea of the inner critic comes from. But if we think about the tribe, per se, there was somebody in the tribe that said, oh, no, you better not do that. You better not do that. And they would say, you know, basically that the, the people in the tribe would say, all right, we heard from you. You know, basically, we heard your viewpoint. And we're going to take it into consideration, but it's not going to dominate the whole conversation or else we wouldn't have made the migration. We wouldn't have tried all these interviews. You know what I mean? So the inner critic has an absolute role both in society and in ourselves, but it shouldn't dominate every conversation because when the inner critic is too dominant, just like anything else, it's out of balance. Yeah. Like yeah, a, and a, be, be kind to yourself, but yet listen to your inner critic. I, I think, think that's that, a good balance. That probably comes up in your career as a psychiatrist quite often. Probably, yeah, probably a lot. You know, we become what we think about all day long and all that. So exactly, exactly. And so I guess the refinement idea is that it's not about getting rid of the inner critic. It's just about basically saying, you know, like, what role does the inner critic play in my life? The inner critic makes me better, makes me strive more. But the, when the inner critic basically makes you give up, then, you know, then it's not serving its purpose anymore. That's that's very true. Well, you know, I think we're going to be winding up our show. So um, now I'm going to ask you the question that we ask all of our guests. And that is, if you could sit on a park bench and chat with anyone from the past, who would it be? Wow. The golden question. So that's a really, really, you you have wonderful questions. So, um, so I'm very interested in increasingly now during our, you know, the first part of the 21st century, I'm very interested in the early part of the 20th century, because it wasn't always that psychiatrists were siloed into like this, into the office per se. But in the early part of the 20th century, you know, during the time when psychoanalysis was sort of rising and we were sort of becoming more interested in, 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 in the mind, mm-hmm. we, we didn't know always wasn't as accepted as it is that psychiatrists would basically dip into theater and art, and they would find themselves in these salons. And there's a particular psych- psychiatrist, his name is Jacob Moreno, and he was he's credited for bringing joy to psychiatry. He was a student of Freud. Mm-hmm. He ended up coming to the United States. And he basically is also sort of the pioneer of group therapy. And one of the things he also did is this idea that's called psychodrama, where basically where a uh, somebody basically brings their con- inner conflict onto the stage and actors act out the conflict on the stage. So I'm very interested in this sort of multidisciplinary psychiatry movement because it wasn't always that people would have asked the question like, as a psychiatrist, you know, how do art and psychiatry fit together? So I'm learning more and more about this idea that there was a major relationship between art, particularly surrealism, collage, data, and psychoanalysis. So somebody like Jacob Moreno would be really fascinating to talk to. Wow. What would be the first question you would ask him? Am I doing the right now? <laughs> <laughs> Am I real? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, no, I would, uh, I think I would probably ask him about himself first. I think that's usually where I start. You know, I try to take the temperature and I would ask him basically, you know, him a little bit, ask him a little bit of background, you know, and then see how the conversation went from there. I think and that, I've heard that he really liked to talk about himself. So, so I'm sure he would, you know, you got to know who your audience is. Like, yeah. I was thinking, well, would it be Freud? Well, I'm not sure Freud would be the best person to have a conversation with, but the, but the psychiatrist who brought joy to psychiatry, that would be one I would want to talk to. Well, if he likes to talk about himself, those are the easiest <laughs> people to talk to because all you have, have to do is say, listen yeah. and they have much to share. And like you, you've had so much to share here. Uh, both Angie and I are glad we had the opportunity to mm-hmm. chat with you. You are absolutely a dynamic personality. And does it sound like I'm reading this? Because I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> you have a, you know, you really, Stephen, you really have a tremendous grasp on creativity. And I know our listeners, uh, they're going to really benefit from this. Yeah, don't you I think, think so too? Yes, Stephen. It was so good to have you with us today. And really appreciate your creative insights and your thoughts on, you know, how to work with your personality versus your creativity. I think that was really yeah, helpful. It was very helpful. Helpful for me and I appreciated it. 
And um, I want to let our listeners know that if you want to know more about Stephen, we will have links for him under the show guest tab on thoughtrowpodcast.com. And that way you can learn more about Stephen, check out his website and connect with him on social media because I'm sure he would love to connect with I you. I think we need to have Stephen back on I think in so the not too. too distant future. I think I need to move in. <laughs> there you go. There you go. We have lots of studio space. Trust yes, me. Yes, yes. A residency at Thought Row Podcast. So thank you. I really, it's been a real pleasure for me and a real honor. And I really appreciate getting to know you both and having the opportunity to talk about creativity. And I hope that the listeners will also benefit. Oh, I think they're going to benefit greatly oh, from I what you so said. Too. You you really shared some insights that, that we don't necessarily always hear. A, a different perspective. And that was great. So very true. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really glad you tuned in today. We hope you enjoyed the thoughts and ideas we shared with you. We post a new podcast every week, so remember to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss an episode. Also, if you're enjoying our podcast, both Rod and I would really appreciate you buying us a cup of coffee. Just go to thoughtrow.com, scroll down a bit, and you can find that link right on our website on the homepage. It's really easy to do, by the way. Yes, it is. Um, and all the money we receive goes to our production costs. Yep. And primarily because we want to keep our show commercial free and we want to continue to bring you the best quality content with great guests. That's right. Thank you for listening to Thought Row Podcast. So it's bye for now from my husband Rod and I, wishing everyone a great day. <laughs>